Tonight, the votes have been cast and counted, and the people of Ontario have swept out the old, saying a resounding goodbye to the long-governing Liberals and hello to the man you can soon call Premier Doug Ford. What will a progressive Conservative Ontario mean for Canada? Also tonight, we're in Quebec City on the eve of an uncertain gathering of G7 leaders. Protesters have already taken to the streets, a, a ritual of G7 meetings. And Donald Trump is still at home, but he's sniping at his host, calling Justin Trudeau so indignant. It's a family affair that might just get ugly. This is The National. The battle for Ontario is over, and so are 15 years of Liberal government. The provincial election campaign was dramatic and combative, shaped in part by the fact that some voters didn't like any of their options. But there were three distinct political directions on offer, and in the end, one ran away with the show. Doug Ford's populist message has led the progressive Conservatives back to power. And remember, it was just months ago, the party seemed to be in complete disarray. But none of that matters now. Hannah Thibodeau is in Toronto tonight, where the dust is still settling. How are you? It's a big win. My friends, this victory belongs to you. Doug Ford delivered a huge majority progressive conservative government. We have sent a clear message to the world. Ontario is open for business. The Tories pulled this off in spite of many obstacles. It's not my values, it's not how I raised, it's not who I am. The PCs didn't even have a leader in late January after Patrick Brown stepped down amid allegations of sexual assault. And there were many other hurdles along the way. You don't have to throw them, so put your name, number, and just sign it. Yeah. Ford himself getting caught on audio tape selling fake memberships for his preferred candidate, Kinga Surma not telling voters exactly how he'll pay for his election promises, and his sister-in-law suing Ford for withholding money from her late husband Rob's estate and mismanaging the family business. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. But the Ford team were able to fend it all off. NDP leader Andrea Horvath did give Ford a run for his money, but was only able to obtain the official opposition consolation prize. I told the Premier-designate that New Democrats will work each and every day for the change that families need to make life better for all of us, for all of us. The NDP started in third, but Just picked up steam after this. Okay. You don't have to choose between insiders and insiders. You don't have to choose. But the momentum stalled as people started to question her candidates and her accounting. And it seems she was not only fighting Doug Ford, but also the ghost of Bob Ray. This is not 1990, and I am certainly not Bob Ray. In fact, he's a Liberal now. As for the Liberals, it was a resounding defeat after 15 years in power. I am resigning as the leader of the Ontario Liberal Party. I know. We're not. <laughs> Gonna cry. <laughs> I have spoken to the party president and asked him to start the process of choosing an interim leader. And it is the right thing to do. There is another generation, and I am passing the torch to that generation. Kathleen Wynne really had no choice. This is the worst result for the Liberals since 1951, when they took seven seats. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Toronto. So now that the people of Ontario have spoken, let's hear a little more from the man who will become Premier. Here's what Doug Ford had to say after securing the win earlier this evening. We have delivered a government that is for the people. <laughs> a government that will respect your hard-earned tax dollars. And my friends, the party with the taxpayers' money is over. It's done. And I know that my brother Rob is looking down from heaven. I also need to acknowledge my opponents in this race to Kathleen Wynne and Henry Orvath. No, 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 guys. No, 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 no. You fought, a, you fought, a, 
You fought a hard, very hard campaign, and I'll tell you, Ontario is better for it. And tonight, we have sent a clear message to the world, Ontario is open for business. Okay, so the bottom line here, Doug Ford is in. Now what? Rosie's been busy delving not just into that question, but of course, co-hosting the election special all night long. Rosie, uh, what do you think? What, what does Doug Ford's Ontario look like? I think it looks pretty different, and it looks pretty different pretty dramatically different right away, actually. Some of the things that Doug Ford and the Progressive Conservatives represent, I think, no surprise, they want less government. They want less government in your life, involved in your decisions. And how do they do that? One of the first things they'll do, they'll try and cut people's income tax. They want to give your money back to you so you can start making some decisions. Another big one, uh, the cap-and-trade system, carbon tax. He doesn't buy into that. He doesn't think that's the best way to deal with carbon emissions. So he'll find his way out of that deal he has between Quebec and California. Then there's other things, like th th there's things that he talked about during that campaign that no one quite understands how he's going to do, but he's going to do it, he says. Cut 10 cents off your gas per liter. I mean, that sounds like a great idea to people in Ontarians. How does he actually make that happen? And he'll start to shave things out of government. Uh, he has promised to do an audit of, if, of, of spending in Ontario, and that inevitably, in, and in spite of what he has said throughout the campaign, means that some things have to go, whether it's uh, public servants, whether it's teachers or nurses, or just parts of the department. You can't cut out $6 billion of Ontario's budget and not see some of those things fade away. So Ontario is going to look a lot different, but clearly that's what Ontarians wanted. They wanted something that looked a lot different than they have seen for the past 15 years. And Rosie, what about the rest of the country? And, you know, especially the federal government. I mean, they're losing a known quantity in Kathleen Wynne. They are, sure. An, an ally, really. Someone that they could count on and bring to the table and try and get other provinces uh, rallied around them to build a consensus. They don't have that anymore. Now, we shouldn't make too big a deal out of it. These are both uh, professional people. Justin Trudeau will know how to deal with Doug Ford. Doug Ford will want things from Justin Trudeau. But the relationship may be combative, especially if we see other shakeups across the pro across the country in terms of elections. Say, for instance, Jason Kenney gets elected in an Alberta election. Th then we have a pro then we have a country that becomes a little bit more difficult for the prime minister to manage. But as you've been talking about, the prime minister is managing or trying, at any rate, to manage Donald Trump right now. Certainly, he can handle Doug Ford and they will have to come to some sort of um, you know acceptable relationship and friendship because they are going to need one another something I always like to point out that Ontario makes up 40 percent of Canada's gross domestic product Ontario has to work for the rest of Canada to work right and tomorrow I guess you, you'll be back on the program breaking it all down with that issue I guess you'll have uh, a couple things to one or two things to, to say maybe yeah. maybe maybe carve out 15 minutes for me <laughs> Right. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what we can do. In the meantime, I wish you good night. I hope you Thank can get you. some sleep, Rosie. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, okay, well, one last note on tonight's result. A victory for the Greens. A small one, but a victory nonetheless. I'm ready to take my seat at Queen's Park. So that's brand new MPP Mike Schreiner winning the riding of Guelph. And in doing so, becoming the first Green Party member ever to win a seat in the Ontario legislature. And the moral here may very well be try, try again, because this is Shriner's third attempt at a seat. And now to another major political story playing out tonight, this one in Quebec City, where we find Ian. Andrew, the G7 summit begins tomorrow, about two hours outside of Quebec City, but it is here that the protesters are hoping to make their voices heard. And those protests have already begun with a march tonight through the downtown as the G7 leaders began arriving. The summit has five themes, investing in growth, preparing for jobs of the future, gender equality, climate change, and building a more peaceful and secure world. But the actions of one G7 leader already overshadowing those intentions. New tweets tonight from Donald Trump taking direct aim at his Canadian host, we have extensive coverage on the tensions inside the summit and out on the streets. Plus, the foreign affairs minister on what Canada hopes to accomplish. First, though, a look at the key locations. 
The action is expected in two places, at the summit itself in La Malle Bay, a resort town that almost seems built for security. One road in, thick woods all around, there's a secure green zone and an even more secure red zone. Nearly four kilometers of fencing around the leaders at the Fairmont Le Manoir Richelieu. Protesters are allowed, but restricted to a small parking lot just outside the green zone. But the major protests are set for Quebec City, not nearly as easy to secure given its size and complexity. Marches are expected to wind up and down the streets, ending at political venues like the U.S. Consulate and the National Assembly. And tonight's protest march, which went right by this building, has been peaceful. But as Jayla Bernstein reports, there were some clear signs of trouble ahead. On the eve of the G7 summit, this message on Quebec City streets was clear. As hundreds of people marched to the downtown core. This was the first of many expected protests, and tension is high. But those who came out to protest peacefully called out police for their confrontational tactics. I was just walking down up to here, and there's much more policemen than, uh, than people that are here to, uh, um, put it to, in the streets to, uh, to, to protest. At least two people were detained and some pushed back against media. While some mass protesters added tension to a potentially volatile situation. But for most, it was maybe even a festive evening. More than 50 different interest groups were represented on the ground. What they all have in common, they're against the G7. It's a joke. Some are against capitalism or worried about gender equality and racism. Others blame G7 leaders for favoring oil and industry over the environment. Uh, we need to start getting serious about cleaning the ocean. This meeting is really uh, a meeting uh, organized by the 1% only to serve the interests of the 1%. Today was a test for what's to come. We have more days of protests. Tomorrow we're supposed to have protests like this, but all day long it's actually being called the Day of Disruption. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Quebec City. While police prepare for mass protests outside the summit tomorrow, inside a face-off of another kind is expected. Six of the leaders against Donald Trump. The CBC's David Cochran has been looking into this and, and you know, really, although there's a long agenda here, there's, there's one issue. Yeah, when Canada became the chair of the G7 for this year, it said it wanted to focus on five broad themes. It's now about one broad theme, and that's how do you deal with the United States in the age of U.S. President Donald Trump? So we're going to hear a very familiar message when, when the leaders start meeting tomorrow, and that's the trade war that Trump has started with the steel and aluminum tariffs is an unacceptable trade war that's only going to hurt everybody, that the tariffs are insulting and unacceptable. So we got a taste of that today when Prime Minister Justin Trudeau met with French President Emmanuel Macron. And in the news conference, Trudeau made it clear that he's not backing down in his positions. There's no attempt to escalate. He's not going to threaten to burn down the White House a second time. They're going to continue with what Canada is calling a polite but firm response to Trump. And here's what Trudeau said today. I can certainly speak personally to say that uh, I have consistently stood up for Canadian interests, consistently uh, demonstrated uh, where we disagree, but done so in a uh, polite and cordial context. I think that's what Canadians have always expected of me, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So President Donald Trump responded, and this being Donald Trump, the response came on Twitter. We've got a couple of tweets we want to show you. The first, please tell Prime Minister Trudeau and President Macron that they are charging the U.S. massive tariffs and create non-monetary barriers. The EU trade surplus with the U.S. is $151 billion, and Canada keeps our farmers and others out. Look forward to seeing them tomorrow, he said unironically. And then another tweet aimed specifically at Prime Minister Trudeau, saying, Prime Minister Trudeau is being so indignant bringing up the relationship that the U.S. and Canada had over the many years and all sorts of other things, but he doesn't bring up the fact that they charge 300% on dairy, hurting our families, killing our agriculture. So Trump, a couple of things there, confirming he is coming. There was some doubt of that, yeah, but he's coming in hot. 
He's coming with his America First agenda. The G6, the other members are going to tell him America First often means America alone. We have just about 30 seconds here, but what does all of this mean for the, the G7? It's going to be a real challenge. The short-term future of the G7 to be effective is at risk this weekend. Normally, you see a communique where they all sign off, a unanimous statement of goals and principles. There's a lot of talk that that's not going to happen at this, that it will be a chair summary from Justin Trudeau. We saw this in Whistler with the finance ministers, and they rebuked the U.S. So there is a splintering and a factioning of the G7. And you you know, tomorrow night, Ian, when the leaders sit down for supper, they're going to get, be entertained by the Cirque du Soleil. If there was ever an event that needed acrobats and contortionists to make it work, <laughs> it's this one. Always so nice to talk to you. Thanks, David. Thanks, Matt. The Prime Minister has always said that Canada is ready for an escalating trade battle with its southern neighbour. Justin Trudeau's point person on the Canada-U.S. file is the Foreign Affairs Minister, Chrystia Freeland, and I sat down with her earlier today. What is going on now? behind the scenes, particularly with your European allies, to try to figure out how to deal with President Trump? Well, you are right, Ian. A lot is going on, and a lot has been going on. Um, and, and I guess maybe that's the important place to start, is uh, I think Canadians are very aware of how hard we have been working with the U.S. and with a broad range of American counterparties, not just the administration, but also legislators, governors, business, union, mayors, you know, the whole country has been blanketed by Team Canada. And do you have further tariffs that might be imposed, you know, that are prepared if the United States decides to kind of raise the ante here as well? Um, so let me start by saying the happy ending to this story is these illegal tariffs are removed by the United States. That's the outcome that we want to get to. That is the good outcome for the United States, for the world, including for Canada. So that would be the, the, the outcome you would hope for? The outcome we want is they take away the illegal tariffs on Canadian steel and aluminum. And so so, so as, that's, that's what we are driving towards. And, and so as we sit here right now, how likely is that to happen and, and, and when? Um, you know, Ian, one of the things I said right at the beginning of the NAFTA negotiation was there would be a lot of drama and we should expect a lot of ups and downs. And that is as far as I go in making predictions. Is there any specific strategy you have to deal with the president? Yes, we have a lot of strategies to deal with the president. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, one thing that I think Canadians have actually been able to see uh, is how able the Prime Minister is to find a connection, I think, with everyone. I mean, I, I, th I think it's a, a very powerful talent he has. We experience it as Canadians. It, it's one of his great skills as a politician. And I see it on the international stage. He, he's very good at talking to anyone and at forming that connection. And he does have a really good relationship with the president. I've seen it face to face in the bilateral meetings that I've attended. And a lot of senior figures in the administration have said to me, you know what, the president, he really likes the prime minister. Now, that relationship, that's not everything, right? And we've seen that you can have that good relationship and still have sharp disagreements about policy. But it's certainly helpful for us as Canadians that our Prime Minister is able to talk to the President of the United States. What do you think the chances are of, of meaningful success here at the G7, given what's happened in the last few days uh, with the President, particularly on tariffs? Oh, I think, I mean, for me, the way I define success at the G7 is that we have the important conversations I think it is important, you know, as Canadians, we are very focused on the economic relationship with the United States and this illegal imposition of tariffs by the U.S. last Thursday is naturally a core concern, and it ought to be, and that will be an issue here. It's important to remember there are many, many other issues in the world, and there will be a lot of other issues discussed. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Great to talk to you. We have more special coverage ahead from Quebec City. It is clear tonight the dynamics of this summit are unlike any other in recent memory. This is going to be the most dysfunctional G7 summit since it was founded in 1975. This is going to be a profound, um, can I say, shit show. 
uh, of, of an international meeting. So with that in mind, we'll get a Canadian perspective from two people who have been inside G7 and G8 meetings, former Prime Minister Paul Martin and former Foreign Affairs Minister John Baird. Our conversations are still to come on The National. Now, the G7 summit is just, believe it or not, one small piece of Donald Trump's immediate schedule. Today, he wrapped a meeting with Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. And while the G7 is the next thing on Trump's agenda, he also had something else on his mind. His upcoming face-to-face -face meeting with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. It's scheduled for next week. And Trump is dropping some hints about how he thinks that could unfold. The CBC's Paul Hunter has that story from Washington. Days away from perhaps making history and, said Donald Trump today, amid meetings with Japan's Shinzo Abe, he's good to go. I think I'm very well prepared. I don't think I have to prepare very much. It's about uh, attitude. It's about uh, willingness to get things done. This isn't a question of preparation. It's a question of whether or not people want it to happen. By that, he means North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, international pariah and oddball commander of fearsome weaponry. He and Trump will shake hands and sit down at this resort in Singapore next week with a long list of mega issues in play. Among them, normalizing relations with the U.S. and officially ending the decades-old Korean War. We could sign an agreement. As you know, that would be a first step. It's what happens after the agreement that really is uh, the big point. But That big yes, point trumps biggie. North Korean denuclearization, getting rid of its nukes permanently. It's Trump's bottom line for the summit. And if things seem to be not headed that way... All I can say is I am totally prepared to walk away. I did it once before. Uh, you have to be able to walk away. As but Trump as says he expects it to be fruitful, at worst, maybe leading to more meetings. How to tell how it's going? Said Trump, take note of his language. Lately, he's stopped using the term maximum pressure and referencing U.S. sanctions on North Korea. We don't use the term anymore because we're going into a friendly negotiation. But if that changes... If you hear me saying we're going to use maximum pressure, you'll know the negotiation did not do well. Frankly. So what's going to happen? Is Trump ready? Is Kim bluffing? As Trump himself might put it, we'll see. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. So the summit happens on Tuesday in Singapore. But remember, that's local time. So here in Canada, expect to hear all about it on Monday night. And we'll have special coverage from on the ground as the two sides meet. Meantime, lots more ahead on tonight's show. There's a crucial vote happening in the Senate on legalizing marijuana in this country. And a little later, Vladimir Putin took some calls today directly from his people, and Canada came up. We'll tell you why. Plus, a historic resort in Nova Scotia reduced to rubble. We're on the roadside watching, and I guess within the hour, the building was engulfed. We watched our uh, room that we were in just collapse to the ground. It's in ashes this morning. Tonight on The National, a grim day in Guatemala as officials admit they were too slow to warn people about Sunday's volcanic eruption that by the time an evacuation alert was issued, it was too late for many of those people who live on the slopes of the volcano. 109 people are now confirmed dead. Hope is dimming for the nearly 200 people still missing. And once again, search crews had to stop their work today because of dangerous conditions. To that other volcano we've been tracking on Hawaii's Big Island, tonight officials released new details on the damage caused since Kilauea began erupting just over a month ago. They say about 600 homes have been destroyed, many of those wiped out just a couple days ago by a slow-moving but unstoppable river of lava. And the victory the Washington Capitals have been dreaming about. For the first time in franchise history, they've won the Stanley Cup, beating the Vegas Golden Knights 4-3 in Game 5. 
and the man who led them to the top of the league, captain Alexander Ovechkin. He was named the most valuable player of the Stanley Cup playoffs. 15 goals in the postseason, a record for the Capitals. Okay, after six months of intense debate tonight, senators finally voted on the Liberal government's landmark bill to legalize recreational marijuana. Now, Catherine Cullen has been following the late night vote closely on uh, Parliament Hill and joins us now from outside the Senate chamber. So, Catherine, let's start with the result. Yeah, Andrew, you know, there was so much scrutiny around this vote, a real sense of drama that had built up. In the end, it wasn't even close. 56 in favor of the government's Cannabis Act, 30 senators opposed, one senator who abstained. Now, of course, that vote is with all of the changes that the Senate wants to see to this piece of legislation. 46 changes, in fact, which by parliamentary standards is, is a pretty darn big number. And now the House of Commons is going to have to take a look at the legislation with all the changes and decide what to do about it. But just because there was a big margin tonight, you shouldn't think that uh, passions around this issue have necessarily calmed. Listen to a bit of what some senators ha had to say after the vote. We know that prohibition doesn't work. I think this is a brave move on the part of the government, frankly, to take on a, a tough and obviously controversial issue. And I, I'm very pleased by the strength of this, this evening's positive vote. I'm very concerned that what we've seen here from the government senators is that there's an attempt to normalize marijuana. And unfortunately, this bill makes marijuana more accessible to teenagers particularly than ever before. And it's very concerning. Okay, so if we take stock of what's happened, I mean, a clear win for the bill, a big step forward for legalization. But as you alluded to, I mean, the passion swirling around this, it, it's not over yet, not by a long shot. That's right. The House of Commons has to consider those changes I was talking about. Some of them are technical, but some of them are more substantive. Questions about whether or not, for instance, provinces um, should, it should be clear that they have the right to ban homegrown ma marijuana because the federal legislation says people can grow it at home, up to four plants per household. So questions about how the federal government's going to deal with that. There's actually a proposal from the Senate to ban branded marijuana merchandise, so things like T-shirts with cannabis logos on them. It's not really clear how something like that would work. So the government, the House of Commons, is going to have to decide how to deal with that. The legislation is going to come back over here. And even if it passes in the Senate, then we still don't know when legalization will take place. Justin Trudeau has said it will be sometime this summer, but the government wants a buffer zone, several weeks for people to get ready. They are going to have to decide exactly what date to push that button on legalization. Andrew? Still a few steps to go. Catherine Cullen outside the Senate tonight. Thanks so much. We have more special coverage for you tonight from Quebec City, including insight from Canadians who have been inside those G7 meetings. Well, it is probably the world's most exclusive you know, mini convention. Uh, there's a lot of uh, opportunities for uh, networking and meetings on the side that perhaps uh, don't get much attention or perhaps as important to the formal agenda. Oh, how the mighty are mocked when seven of the world's most powerful leaders gather in one place. All sorts of groups try to get some of that global attention. This puppet show by Oxfam is meant to draw attention to women's issues. As the G7 leaders get settled in at a resort in La Malle Bay, Quebec, let's take a quick look at how membership to this elite club has changed over the years. The first meeting of big players was in 1975, created to deal with an oil crisis and turmoil in the world economy. Only six members then, the US, UK, France, Italy, Germany and Japan. A year later, the US President Gerald Ford invited Canada to join. It became the G7. In 1998, it became the G8 when Russia joined, but Russia was suspended in 2014 after it annexed Crimea. So this year, as we've been saying, some are wondering if this really is the G6 plus one. The shadow looming over the summit is that the most powerful leader is also the most unpredictable. They are referred to as the family photos, a symbol of the close relationship among the leaders and their countries. But many are wondering what this year's portrait will look like when old friends are nursing new grievances, like Trump's tariffs on steel and aluminum. 
Susan Lejeune Dalgirzak is the UK's top diplomat to Canada. I mean, the United States and the United Kingdom, like Canada and the United States, are really close partners. Um, and you don't expect your close partners to, uh, to do something as unacceptable as this. And uh, free trade uh, is very, very important to us um, and will become more important to us as we leave the European Union. So where does that leave this year's G7? Ian Bremmer is an author, foreign policy analyst, and professor at New York University. This is going to be the most dysfunctional G7 summit since it was founded in 1975, and it's not even close. I mean, this is, this is going to be a profound, um, can I say shit show, uh, of, of an international meeting. They're our allies, but they take advantage of us. Trump's disruption of the traditional world order goes beyond tariffs. The U.S. has pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership, the Iran deal, as well as ditching the Paris Climate Accord, leaving behind their G7 peers. We have lived uh, for decades now in a Pax Americana. Not everyone loves it, uh, but nonetheless, it has been a U.S.-led Western architecture. The Bretton Woods institutions, uh, the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO, uh, the G7, the G20, the United Nations, that's the way the world order has run. And that order is in enormous threat right now. Uh, there is a level of creative destruction of our geopolitical order um, that no one is filling. The Chinese are building some alternative architecture, uh, but America First is running away from it. Um, and uh, that is going to be in very clear evidence in Canada this week. To get a Canadian view, we turn to some people who have been inside those G7 meeting rooms. First, John Baird, who is Stephen Harper's foreign affairs minister. There's some suggestion that achieving any kind of meaningful consensus out of this meeting is very unlikely and primarily because of, of Trump. What's your view on that? Well, I think you know, if, if, all, uh, if all seven or eight countries that got together agreed on everything, you wouldn't need to have a meeting. Whenever the United States is around the table, obviously everyone's a second tier player. Just the size of their economy, the size of their population, the fact that they're the uh, only global superpower, uh, that's a, a huge dynamic. Uh, but Canada plays a, a big role. You know, we are in the G7, we certainly are number seven. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the, the 12th largest global economy. But you know, uh, the United Kingdom just fell uh, to number six in terms of the global economy. Uh, India's economy passed it. And now with uh, the rise of China, I mean, Canada's economy was bigger than China 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. So the, the world is becoming demonstrably more complex uh, and, and more difficult to steer in the right way. I think Still, the, drawing on his personal support, experience, Baird says the don't the underestimate the value of one-on-one -on -one meetings. Well, it is probably the world's most exclusive you know, mini-convention. Uh, there's a lot of uh, opportunities for uh, networking and meetings on the side that perhaps uh, don't get much attention but are perhaps as important to the formal agenda. I think that we're going into this G7 meeting in a very different set of parameters than, the, the, than, than what has happened historically since uh, the end of the Second World War. Former Prime Minister Paul Martin was in British Columbia last week speaking to G7 finance ministers. We are going to have to basically reassert the optimism that globalization is a good thing and globalization can be made to work. Like Baird, Martin is optimistic there will be some meaningful agreement at the G7 reached behind closed doors. The most important part of any uh, G7 meeting is the dinner. And I have found that those dinners are where more is accomplished and effectively you're able to talk to the other person, look him or her in the eye um, and say, look, you know, you're, you're, you're not where we are and you're not going to succeed. Uh, and the, basically the answers come back and forth. Uh, and I, I have great hopes uh, fundamentally uh, for that private dinner. But for all of their experience at these summits, keep in mind neither Martin nor Baird have ever dealt with a U.S. president like Donald Trump, a president who has turned unpredictability into a political doctrine. Justin Trudeau's green credentials may be on the line at this summit, especially after his government bought the Kinder Morgan pipeline. His goals here include leading the G7 to improve the health of the oceans by reducing plastic pollution. The movement against disposable plastic gained momentum last month in Vancouver. The city will ban plastic straws starting next year. So will Scotland.
The rest of the UK may follow suit as it studies a ban on straws, cotton swabs and stir sticks. But one California city saw no need to wait. Malibu, the home of movie stars and that gorgeous beach, has taken a hard stand against disposable plastic. Kim Brunhuber shows us why. On a beach in Malibu, a group of young tourists from Argentina have no idea. Starting this month, what's in their drinks is illegal. Not the soda, the straws. Did you know that here in Malibu, plastic straws are banned? No, I mean, it's, it's so common to use them. They are as ubiquitous as seaweed. Almost anywhere you look along the California coast, bobbing in the surf like the masts of toy sailboats are thousands and thousands of plastic straws. One study estimated that the world's oceans are polluted with 270,000 metric tons of plastic. 7% of that plastic, according to another study, is made up by straws and stir sticks. Every time I'd go to the beach, I'd notice tons of plastic, and among that plastic, there was almost always 50% straws. Moravati is a frustrated Malibu resident, fed up with all the straws washing up on the beach. They end up in our waterways, they end up in sea life, and they end up back in us. So last year, she started lobbying lawmakers to ban them, and it worked. Right now, all of these are banned in the city this of Malibu? This whole bottom area is banned in our city to be replaced with all the stuff that you see at the top of this. Malibu's ban, among the first and most stringent so far, covers not just straws, but other disposable plastics like cutlery. It's similar to a recent proposal by the European Union Commission that would limit single-use plastics, which the Commission claims makes up 70% of European beach litter. But in Malibu, some business owners balk at the cost of replacing all that plastic. It's going to be expensive. We have to raise the prices down. We don't want to do that, but we have to. All this is sustainable. It's grown. Wagner insists the price of eco-friendly alternatives like these will come down. And Malibu's trendy status, he says, makes the city an environmental influencer. With 13,000 residents, we're not polluting that much. But with 15 million visitors to our city every year, we can educate the visitors, and hopefully they take that information and disseminate it in their neighborhood. Most of us suck. Hollywood has embraced the cause. Suck, suck, suck. With efforts like this online campaign. By 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. And in recent months, several big cities like New York and major national chains have proposed or adopted their own bans. The associations that represent Californian and Canadian plastic manufacturers told the CBC they oppose these bans, but declined an interview. Oh. As for those young lawbreakers... If we can um, avoid using a little more plastic, plastic so why not? Something he'd never even thought about before, he says, is now hard to unthink. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Malibu, California. And today, IKEA joined the crusade to cut back on plastic waste. The Swedish retail giant committing to stop selling single-use plasticware like cutlery and straws by 2020. It says its global reach could help inspire more than a billion customers, but sheer size can also limit a corporation. Just days ago, McDonald's CEO said there's no replacement for plastic straws on the vast scale required. With 60 million customers a day, the demand is simply too great. That's it for us tonight from Quebec City. We'll be back here tomorrow night as the summit officially begins. Until then, let's go back to Andrew in Vancouver. Yeah, and we still have a lot more ahead tonight, including how Canada fit into Vladimir Putin's annual call-in television show in Russia. He had plenty of blame to pass around, but sympathy for this country. But first, let's take you to Nova Scotia, where the tiny village of Fedek has suffered a devastating blow. A historic inn considered an icon of the community and a draw for people from across the country. It went up in flames last night. Wow. It's being described as an angry fire and one that moved quickly. It took just hours to turn 170 years of history to ash. We heard someone running up and down the hallway uh, who turned out to be an employee of Inverary Resort, uh, and he was just banging on doors, uh, telling people, you know, there is a fire, get out, get out. 
It was around 2 a.m. local time. The heart of the Inverary Resort went up in flames. Fortunately, everyone got out in time and safely. We watched our uh, room that we were in just collapse to the ground. And as the sun rose over Cape Breton, this was what was left of the original building. There's no official word yet on a cause, but firefighters have zeroed in on the kitchen. We had breakfast yes. there the day before and, and dinner there last night, lovely lobster, and now it's all gone. The Inverary was built around 1850 as a private estate. It was converted to an inn after the Second World War, but ownership stayed within a tight-knit group of families, including the current owners, who've run the resort for almost half a century. We've had generations of uh, people stay there. We've had generations of people work there. So it is a very important, uh, iconic um, signature resort that we lost today in our community. The loss is immense, but incredibly, there's also a glint of hope. Despite losing the dining room, the kitchen, reception area, and some rooms, enough areas were spared that the resort is actually still open for business. It is Russia's most popular television call-in show and a political ritual for viewers. Their chance to ask Vladimir Putin directly for help in a country with a notoriously blunt bureaucracy. Sometimes a plea to the president himself is the best way to get things done. But this time around, as Moscow correspondent Chris Brown explains, we also got a glimpse into why Canada has been on Putin's mind. Once a year, Vladimir Putin casts himself as Russia's fixer-in-chief as ordinary Russians call in on national TV and plead with him to solve their problems. This St. Petersburg truck driver complained about high gas prices. Blame the energy minister, said Putin, who had all of his nervous-looking cabinet ministers at the ready to explain why things are going wrong. It reinforces the message that Putin's Kremlin gets things done. It's a bureaucracy that's failing people. These people beg Putin to save their local hospital in Stronio, a few hours outside of Moscow. We don't have medicine or equipment, pleaded this woman. We're being left with nothing. Others wrote in complaining about a sluggish economy, wondering when U.S.-led sanctions will be lifted. They're a means to restrain Russia, said Putin, but then added, it's not only Russians who are being treated badly. The introduction of restrictive U.S. tariffs on steel, on aluminum, not only for Europe, but also for Canada and Mexico. In essence, these are also sanctions, said Putin, suggesting Canada and Russia now share a common cause. Putin was also asked about the fate of Ukrainian filmmaker Oleg Sentsov, who's on a hunger strike in a Russian prison. Sentsov was arrested four years ago after protesting Russia's takeover of Crimea and charged with terrorism. A who's who of the global arts and literary community, including Canadian author Margaret Atwood, have demanded his release. But when asked if he'd consider a prisoner swap, Putin appeared to rule it out, saying he would not release a terrorist. Sensov is demanding that scores of other political prisoners from Ukraine being held in Russia also be released. But there are fears he could die during soccer's World Cup, which begins here next week. But time and again today, Vladimir Putin told Russians he's not budging, not on Sensov, nor on the many other contentious issues that dominate Russia's relationship with the West. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. And the moment is up next. But as we go to break, remember, you can get more of The National every afternoon in your inbox. Our newsletter takes a closer look at the big stories of the day. Today, we dove into some of the numbers around the G7 summit. 28 hours, three meals, and hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars. Subscribe to The National today, cbc.ca slash The National. Tonight on The National, Facebook is warning millions of users that some posts you thought were private 
may actually have been made public due to a software glitch. For several days last month, the company says the bug caused 14 million users' privacy settings to be changed to public. That meant posts intended to be shared only with friends were actually shared with everyone. Facebook has apologized. It says the bug has been fixed, and it will alert everyone affected. Uh, this is a difficult day for me personally. We're talking about a you know, disappointing situation for everyone. After a week of turmoil for the Philadelphia 76ers, that was the team's owner announcing today that his general manager, Brian Colangelo, has resigned. Colangelo, a former GM with the Toronto Raptors, was publicly linked last week to a number of Twitter accounts used to trash some of his own players. His wife has since admitted to running the account, apparently to defend and support him, but an external review found that Colangelo was reckless with sensitive team information. And David Suzuki accepted an honorary degree from the University of Alberta today. That's where the 82-year-old began his career before he became an environmental activist and fierce oil sands critic. That second distinction is what made today quite contentious. While some in the crowd cheered, others, including several dozen protesters, called it an insult, saying Suzuki's anti-oil sands campaign has hurt the province. Well, as you all know, Ontarians, young and old, exercised their civic duty today. But we want to zero in on one of them to cap the night off. 21-year-old Alma Ackle from Windsor, Ontario. She and her family arrived from Syria four years ago, and it was only this past April she became a Canadian citizen. Her visit to the polls is our moment of the day. It's actually my first time ever voting. I came here when I was 17. I never got a chance to vote in Syria. So it's a really special day for me. It, it's uh, an honest chance, right? You have the chance to go and look into each party and see exactly what they are offering, to challenge what they are offering. I went online, I was asking my friends, um, I was looking into each party and comparing um, what I would need. There are some really big issues. So, how'd it go? It's all done. It's nice to have voiced our opinion, right? It was funny studying for the citizenship test. One of the questions was, what are your responsibility as a Canadian? And one of them was volunteering, being a good citizen, such as coming to voting. So it was a requirement for me to become a Canadian. So um, yeah, it, it's a really big responsibility. And it's a privilege, actually, to come and vote. Well, yeah, and you can see voting was much more about uh, than just being about checking boxes for her. And that's not a small thing, uh, considering voter turnout in Ontario elections, including this one, has almost perpetually hovered at around the 50% mark, give or take. Something else we're thinking about. That's The National for this June 7th. Have a good night.